right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for this uh, fourth in our uh, most recent webinar series. Uh, so this is the fourth and final presentation uh, in this series, and uh, we'll be hearing from Catherine McClellan and Jillian Joe today. Uh, I'll introduce them to you in a moment. My name, as Linda said, is Joanna Bleckman, and I'm one of the managers of the Measures of Effective Teaching Longitudinal Database Archiving Project at ICPSR. Uh, ICPSR is a unit of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. So I'm going to take just a minute to uh, quickly plug our recently recorded webinar series um, I'll also show you where you can find uh, some NET project and NET LDB resources on our website. Uh, and then I'll turn the presentation over to Catherine and Jill. But first, our instructors, uh, instructors today are Catherine McClellan, who is a psychometrician at Clouder Consulting, and Jillian Joe, a research project manager at ETS. Catherine and Jill uh, directed the video capture and scoring procedures for the, for the NET project. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that they were able to join us today uh, and share their experience and their expertise and really add to our understanding of the, uh, this really incredibly important aspect of the MET, MET project. Okay, so as promised, a, a very quick plug for the MET LDB webinar series um, along with the, the recordings that we recently posted. Uh, so in September of last year, we presented an overview of the MET project given by Carrie Kerr from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, along with a discussion of data files available and data and the data access process. Um, that is available on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to, to uh, take a look at it. It will offer you a really great overview of the MET project and the, the files that we have available and how you gain access to them. Uh, also, over the last couple of weeks, we've presented three other webinars. Um, one uh, on the logistics of accessing and scoring the video data, one on the randomized component of the MET project, and our most recent was a discussion of uh, a few of the current secondary analysis projects using the LDB. Uh, they covered their research questions, uh, methods, and, and preliminary findings. So all of these webinars are currently available on ICTSR's YouTube channel, um, which you can get to from the MET LDB website. And speaking of the LDB website, I'm going to toggle over there. Um, so I'm going to um, just sort of highlight the, the few places on the website where you can find some really useful resources uh, on the MET project and the LDB. Uh, so first of all, I encourage you to um, sign up for our listserv, which you can, you can uh, do up in the upper right-hand corner of our website here. If you click on this link and then um, provide your email address, uh, you will receive emails maybe once every couple months uh, letting you know about data trainings that are upcoming, webinars like these, um, new data that become available, uh, significant changes to documentation, things like that. I'll also point you toward the uh, related resources page here. Um, so we have a featured webinar here. Uh, the rest of the webinars are linked um, right here. You can get to the YouTube channel and see all of them. Uh, we also have uh, a series of the, um, the MET project publications that came from the Gates Foundation, um, so including articles, practice briefs, research papers, etc. So keep an eye out on these, this website, these pages, because um, my, my team here has, a, has a, a pretty good list of additional resources that we plan to create to help you better understand the longitudinal database. Um, so keep an eye out. If you join the listserv, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know when those become available. OK. I am now going to send it over to Catherine, and we'll begin the, the meat of the presentation. OK, thanks, Joanna. Let's see if we can get my screen showing. Can everyone see that? Yep. Great, OK. So as Joanna said, um, Jill and I were part of the MET project itself, and I was the director of the video scoring, and I dragged poor Jill into the process as well. And she was an invaluable ally and colleague in getting this project done. Um, the project was huge and staggeringly difficult to do, like most things like this. I actually made Steve Cantrell laugh. He's a MET project officer at the Gates Foundation. He asked me if I thought it had been a good project, and I told him, it was a good thing to have done, but it was a terrible thing to do um, because it was stressful and hard, a huge amount of work, and we were creating something that had never been done. And to some extent, we were designing it and building it 
sort of the next day after we finished the designs, and that's always a difficult thing to do. But at the same time, it was a fabulous project to be involved in because we got to learn things we could learn no other way than doing the things we were doing and building the things we were building and figuring out how to solve the problems that inevitably come up when you're running a project like this that essentially has had no pilot and is sort of straight to the field built. It was incredibly complicated. We were deeply, deeply grateful to the thousands of teachers and hundreds of thousands of students who were involved in the project and let us basically come in and sit in the back of their classroom, let us assess them, let us do all of the things that the MET project let us do to them and for them and with them, um, with our collaboration and cooperation. And it was, it was a fascinating project to have done. It was a very difficult project to do, but we enjoyed it. And I think the team, we refer to ourselves as the MET survivors who worked on the project, had a great deal of fun and learned a lot and enjoyed working on it. And like I said, I worked in the educational testing service at the time. I now run my own company, but at the time I was the director of human scoring, which means that everything that ETS scored with a person to some extent fell under my purview to deal with the quality control. And the net project sort of fell into our laps um, through a collaboration with TeachCake, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I was in that director position, and Jill was one of my colleagues who worked with me on that project, so I will let her tell you a little bit about herself now. Jill, are you there? Okay, Jill, I can't hear you. As Catherine um, said, I was a part of the NET video scoring project team, that wonderful team, and I provided psychometric uh, research scoring design and emotional support um, for team members. Um, I led the analysis, of, and we'll talk about different aspects of the, of the scoring design, but one piece of that was to set passing standards for the certification test, the rare certification test. So I, I led that effort with the academic partners. Um, uh, and I also co-authored the online bias training. Um, so I had the privilege of um, having my hands in a lot of, of the pieces of this work. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a huge, huge learning opportunity for me as a fairly new psychometrician um, out of grad school. So. Right, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about what actually happened on this study. You probably have some context for it, but here's a basic background set of information about it. Um, the study was originally budgeted at $45 million, and I will tell you we went over that. So by education standards, this was a huge study, not only the scale of the teachers and the students involved in it, but the budget. You don't often work on $50 million studies in education. It was very interesting. Um, we got six big districts who were quite different in profile in terms of rural, suburban, urban profiles, race, ethnicity profiles. They're all big urban districts, but they were all quite different. So their composition in terms of the backgrounds, the languages, all sorts of different types of schools, independent schools versus private schools, public schools, charter schools, the mix was different in every district, which helped make this even more interesting. They list year one and year two videos, and those are correct, but I will tell you that the year one videos tended to be collected towards the end of the first year because there were some difficulties getting the cameras into the districts and getting the upload software working. So year one is really only in the spring semester of year one. Year two was collected throughout year two. So we did um, actually sort of try to get this spread out more in year two and did were successful in that, which was good. Um, there were more than 3,000 teachers involved in this and all of their students. And we got, on average, we got four lessons in each of two years. So we got about eight videos typically from each of those teachers. So roughly 24, 25,000 videos total. Um, each of those videos were scored on multiple instruments. Depending on the content area, we scored them on a different instrument. And we only scored about 14,000 of them because we really only ended up scoring the randomization sample. So if you were here for one of the earlier webinars that Joanna referred to about randomization, you'll probably know what that is. We'll cover it very briefly later on. But we did not score the whole sample. So there are videos in the set that have no scores associated with them. As we mentioned earlier, ETS was actually subcontracted by TeachScape, uh, and this is one of those coincidental, if I'd been in the bathroom at another moment, none of this would have happened to me, stories. Um, they, TeachScape was at ETS visiting someone else to talk about another contract entirely, and someone stuck her head in my office and said, oh, they just got this big touring contract, do you want to come have lunch with these guys? And I thought, sure, free lunch, I'm in, why not? 
And that led to our being subcontracted to take over the video scoring about three months later once they realized what they'd gotten themselves into. Um, so that was quite an interesting discussion. So we did the video scoring in sort of all aspects of it. We dealt with five instruments. You can see them listed there. Class, which is from the University of Virginia. Framework for Teaching, Charlotte Danielson's instrument. Plato, which is a language arts instrument from the um, Stanford University, led by Pam Grossman. MQI, who came out of Harvard, Heather Hill's instrument for judging mathematics teaching. And QST, which was actually developed for this study, also at Stanford by Ray Pichon's group. Um, I had to lay out the specs on how to build TeachScape scoring software because they'd never built scoring software before because they'd never done scoring before. But I was fortunate they had a very strong engineering team that I got to work with. So I laid out the design and they made it happen. It was sort of magical. And if you have to work with a good software team, you know what that's like. You say, it should do this. And a couple of weeks later, miraculously, it just does, which was great fun. Um, and ETS also took on hiring and managing all aspects of the raters. Um, that turned out to be a big job because there were a lot of them and we had to train and pay and do all of the other things that we had to do. Um, so it was a two-year project. Um, the full project ran out to three years in terms of the MET itself, but there were two years of video and two years of our work in it. There were many phases of the scoring, more than you might think, and Jill will talk about those a little bit later. Um, academic partners, as we said, came from the University of Virginia, from Stanford, from Harvard, and Charlotte Danielson, who is not an academic but has her own company, the Danielson Group, so we had several different aspects of that work to manage. Um, ETS did coordinate the work across the academic partners. We were very fortunate to get to work with world-class instrument developers, some of the best in the field, and get to know them and work with their instruments was a true privilege. Um, but these instruments were not necessarily designed for the thing we were doing with them, because the thing we were really doing with them was coming much closer to an assessment of their teaching practices in the classroom on these videos. And many of them have been designed with something slightly different in mind. They've been designed much more about initiating a professional conversation about teaching practice and teaching skills and strengths and weaknesses. And that's a distinction that starts to make a difference when you've been given a very specific charge, um, as I was. Tom Kane, who was the PI for this project, a guy who's now at Harvard. He was at Harvard before he was on lead at the Gates Foundation for two years to lead this project wanted something very specific from us, and my charge from Tom was to build a very high quality score data set from the observations that could be used in statistical modeling around improving the quality of the prediction of the value-added models. That's Tom's interest, is very much in value-added modeling, that type of work, and so that was what he told me to do, was get the data from the observations up to a very high quality standard. And so we did, but that meant that in some cases the instruments really had to be tightened up and cleaned up language tightened up, exemplars given, training altered, many things done to make them function more closely as an assessment instrument and less as a basis for discussion or professional interactions. So uh, that was what we were required to do, that was what we did, and all of that took a major human capital investment not only on the part of the academics partners but on the part of ETS, the part of the Raiders. There were a huge number of people involved in this, all of whom worked really, really hard to make this project happen. Um, this is a piece of the full MET project organizational chart because there's no possible way we could have gotten the whole thing onto one slide. So you see Tom Kane there in the green, he was the PI of the overall project, and you see in the sort of teal color um, some of the core partners who built this project from scratch. Teachscape um, was our contractor, ETS contracted to Teachscape. You see below them the academic institutions, the University of Virginia and Harvard and Stanford and the Danielson group who provided the instruments and often in provided their graduate students or other people to help support this work. Um, RAND, if you were in the earlier webinars you probably heard from, did a lot of the work in value-added modeling and sampling. Westat did the field data collection. They actually helped manage the process in the districts of getting the videos captured, the equipment shipped around, answering questions, helping schedule things, doing all the things that actually gets the data to come in the door. And Westat is extraordinarily good at that sort of work. Um, the student survey was Tripod, which of course is Ron Ferguson's work at Harvard, and that was another contract, so we had student survey data. Um, the National Mathematics and Science Institute had an instrument that they called UTOP, which was in addition to the five we were primarily dealing with. UTOP chose to come in and score a subset of the math videos on their instrument to do some comparative work. And in addition to the work we were doing on scoring the videos at ETS, there was actually a different and additional contract at ETS with the Content Knowledge for Teaching, or CKT, assessments that were part of the contract for MET that was done directly, and Drew Jatomer led that effort. 
So there's some of the key partners. That's not all of them, but like I said, we would run out of space if we tried to put them all on here. Um, in the orange, you'll see sort of ETS's primary team there. That was my team that led the scoring. There was a software development team, for TeachScape's team, and a project management team that was shared between TeachScape and ETS. And under the scoring, which we've blown out into some detail, you'll see we had a project management team. We had a research team, which Jill very much had a strong hand in leading. Um, our scoring and logistics team really did make this come to life in a lot of ways because they had to figure out how to find, hire, process, paperwork, schedule, and manage a huge number of raters on multiple instruments, and this work was all distributed. So none of the raters physically came on site to do the main scoring work. They were distributed all over the country, and this work was done online, which adds to the joy and challenges of getting the scheduling done. So they had a very hard job, and they managed it as sort of remarkably well, and as smooth as this could possibly have done. Um, so we're very grateful for the work they did. Uh, we had a content team director and content leads, and those people, in all cases, faced one of the academic partners. So we had somebody whose expertise was carefully matched with CLASS or with Framework or with QST or MQI or Plato. So we had content leads in each of the five instruments so that they could interact directly with the people who had these instruments for observing teaching practice. Because I am a psychometrician, that is not my area of expertise, but I wanted to make sure that on our team we had people who could speak their language and help interact with them particularly given that we were driving towards making some modifications or changes to their instruments with the way their instruments were scored or building training for observers using their instruments. And we wanted to make sure that that interaction didn't get diluted by my lack of knowledge about what teaching practice and observation of teaching practice is in their expertise. So we had expertise on ETS's side as well as having it on the academic partner's side. Obviously, if we had to train and score hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of raters. We had to have human resources involved in this because the paperwork to hire an employee is, as you probably know if you've ever been hired, quite large. So we had to have all of that done by our HR team. And we had general counsel involved here. Now, if you, many of you have ever thought about this, but when we're dealing with video, the wonderful thing about video is you can see everything. And the terrible thing about video is you can see everything. Um, this is video of minors. Um, and so it is very, very important that we maintain security at all times because video of minors is in fact legally something you have to take very, very strong steps to protect. So we did, but that meant we worked carefully with our general counsel's office to make certain that we were not violating anyone's privacy and there was a lot of privacy law that I had to learn that I didn't know before this started. Make sure that we were staying within the law and that we were protecting both our clients and the teachers and the students in every way possible so that none of this became a problem for anyone. You never saw that video show up on YouTube, which we are thankful for. So we worked very hard to make sure that we stayed within all the legal and propriety constraints to make sure that everyone's information was carefully protected as long as this process went on. So there was a huge amount of human capital invested in this project, and particularly in the scoring part where we had a huge number of people working on this at any given time. So we we're very lucky that the staff we had was as good as they are, as professional as they are, and as talented as they are to do this work. And I am now going to hand over to Jill to let her talk about the processes you see on your screen. Hey, Catherine. So what this uh, particular slide is showing you all is an overview of all of the things that had to happen before we even got to the point of scoring the um, 14,000 plus videos that we, in, we uh, actually ended up scoring. It was really interesting because with the aggressive timelines of this particular project, we might think that two years is a decent amount of time, but if you've ever been in a space where you've um, had to score a huge volume of video, um, with, as Catherine said, um, from scratch based on you know, very little um, information in terms of how to really get this done efficiently, um, and within certain timelines that you know that two years really isn't a whole lot of time at all. And so we, we actually had to um, conduct all of these pre-scoring processes in parallel with one another. So for example, the scoring design and the scoring design studies had to be done um, uh, prominently with the building of the software. Um, ideally, you want to have the scoring design already planned, already um, specified before you went into, before you go into the software build, but we had to sort of do that um, in conjunction with, with each other. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, each of these tracks, or each of these elements, these pre-scoring processes um, later in the webinar, 
But what I do want to focus on here is the third block, the dark blue block, which is which begins with master code videos, and in particular talk about the training component because we don't get into much of that later into the webinar. Um, but just know that we certainly had to invest a considerable amount of time in building the, the training for Raiders because uh, the quality of scoring hinges upon the quality of the training. And so um, all of the, our APs, our content leads, uh, invested their time into building the, the content um, pieces and also selecting the actual um, exemplars that went into training. Note that NQI and FLAS, they actually had their own software system, training software system. And so what was built um, by Teachscape was specifically for the framework Plato and QST instruments. Um, and so, so we have the four, four parallel tracks, the scoring design track, and the software build track, the, uh, the content track is what I like to call it, and then finally the, the personnel track, the, the people management track, making decisions about greater qualifications, who can score the videos, and how much should we pay them, and, um, making decisions about recruitment, where do we get these folks from, and, um, and also how do, we, how do we train them, uh, do, we, uh, do we pay them for training, which we did, we paid Raiders for training, um, even if they did not certify, we still had to pay them for training, so as Catherine mentioned, General Counsel's Office and Human Resources in particular, um, we're very, very adamant about um, the pay structure is extending to training. So uh, we, we trained the certified raiders and scoring leaders and we also had to manage um, through our scoring and logistics office or staff um, the, the raiders and scoring leaders. Um, I wanted to also mention here that there were different, depending on the phase of the video scoring project, and we'll talk about phases a little bit later, but depending on the phase, um, there were different modes of training implemented. And so, for example, for plan, plan B scoring, as we like to call it, plan B scoring, which was, like I said, we'll talk about later, but involved the class instrument only, we had to go through um, very manual processes because the scoring software had not yet been built. And so uh, the, the, the training, the trains were face-to-face, -face, a mixture, a hybrid of face-to-face -face and some online training through class, uh, classes TeachStone software. And so, so just note that the training, the training mode, um, the online training that the online distributed scoring, the online training that Catherine mentioned was not necessarily uh, consistent across the different phases of the of the video scoring project, particularly between um, phase uh, plan B and phase phase one. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So again, uh, the whole the point of um, all the processes that we designed was to produce high quality data for the larger research agenda. And as Catherine mentioned, we uh, one primary objective, one primary goal was to provide scorable observation instruments. And in order to do that, in order to take these instruments that were used for um, traditionally for the purpose of professional conversations and professional development between the administrator, the principal, and the teacher, we had to rethink how we were going to get these instruments into a form in which um, non-expert raters could use them reliably. And so what uh, what the SAE, I had no role in this. So what the APs and the content leads, um, what they were charged with doing was taking their instrument and refining them. And they refined them in, in the following ways. They reduced the number of traits that uh, a reader had to observe because we were very concerned about cognitive load in this space. Not only, um, so the, the, no, the, I, the task of observing is complex in and of itself. I'm just having to attend to verbal and oral, oral uh, behaviors. And so um, what we wanted to do was minimize that cognitive load 
to um, by reducing the number of traits that individuals had to observe. We also, uh, we, the content use in the AP, clarified and sharpened the language that was, um, that described each of the dimensions or traits in, in their rubrics. And we also, they also provided more detailed description about the, the levels of practice at each scoring level, just so that, again, graders would be able to discriminate more accurately between uh, or among the score points for each scale. Uh, another objective was to, clearly to score a large number, large number of videos reliably. And so we conducted several small scale studies to answer some significant questions about the extent to which um, different, different designs could produce uh, efficient and reliable scoring. And two of those questions, what number of scales can a, a rater efficiently and reliably score? And this speaks to in, um, the, the whole idea of minimizing cognitive load on raters. And I'll talk a little bit more about those scoring design studies that we conducted. Also, how much video um, needs to be viewed um, to generate a, rely a, a reliable score? Does it need to be a whole 60-minute or 90-minute lesson, or can it be much shorter than that? Can it be 15 or 30 minutes? And given our, again, our, the aggressive timeline, it was really critical that we answer these questions um, so that we could get the amount of scoring that we needed to get done within the time frame we were given. We also had to institute complex video distribution rules. And Catherine will talk a little bit more about, about what those rules were. But essentially, we wanted to make sure that we were eliminating any sources of bias that were, um, for example, could be attributed to familiarity. Um, if by any chance a reader happened to know a particular teacher from a, uh, from a district that he or she formerly taught or currently taught in, um, or that, um, so, so we, we, like I said, we'll talk a little bit more, or Catherine will talk a little bit more about the distribution rules that we uh, instituted, but we, again, want to minimize Rater bias or the influence of any particular raters' um, uh, biases on uh, on scoring. We also again had to meet very strict scoring completion deadlines, and so in order to do that, it was important to again, ask answer the question of, of how much viewing time was necessary for uh, a, for producing a reliable score. And again, you know, we our objective was not to produce um, feedback to the teacher, it was simply to produce a high quality set of observation score data um, for the larger research agenda. We, in order to do this, in order to get scoring done, we had to hire and train thousands of raters. Um, and it's interesting because the original request that we, we got for, for this project, when Catherine sat down and met with T-Scape and, and they began to um, talk more about the, the details of the project, we, the initial specification was for 250 raters. And so um, we can laugh about it now, but it, it, it definitely, and given the volume of, of the videos that need to be scored in the time that they, need to, that they need to be scored, 250 raters certainly was not going to get it done. So um, we had to ramp up our expectations. Uh, and then finally, we had to, the scoring design goal, um, the scoring design had to um, incorporate this notion of um, cost efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness and uh, scalability. We did not meet this particular goal. Uh, it, 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 as Catherine mentioned, it was a hugely expensive scoring effort. And um, in terms of scalability, however, we, we were able to uh, scale up these, this traditional classroom observation um, method to a, a larger, uh, a larger, a larger scale, which was I think really interesting and really pivotal in the space of human construction response scoring. All right, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, scoring design research that we conducted to inform our decisions about um, the about how we were going to to get scoring done. So again, uh, with respect to cognitive load and making certain that raters were able to 
view these videos, store these videos, rely, videos reliably, um, minimize the fatigue effect on videos, uh, on scoring. Uh, we had to think creatively about how, how, to, how to restructure the whole scoring process, how to restructure the, the scoring instruments, in fact. And so one of those um, projects and one of those studies was um, what the objective or at least the, the purpose was to reduce the, the number, the cognitive load by organizing or grouping, clustering the, the traits or the, scale, the scales on a particular instrument into, um, into, into groups or into groups that had common time frames of critical incidents or groups of, of traits that complement each other. For example, um, grouping a high inference trait such as co uh, student cognitive engagement with a fairly low inference trait such as managing classroom procedures. And so what we did um, to, to uh, in investigate whether or not we could, in fact, reduce um, the cognitive, cognitive load by organizing these skills to smaller groups and, and get a reliable score was we used the master coded video um, which included timestamps and evidence, and we, uh, our stat analysis team, or our data analysis team, they did, extracted those, um, the evidence and the timestamps, and created a frequency distribution um, that's shown here at the bottom of the, of the screen. And, um, and so what you have here is the evidence plotted along uh, or against time, the frequency of comments, the frequency of the evidence statements, and the, the, the time point in the video. And the green, the green plot here, I'm pointing with my finger because I can't point with my mouse, but the green, the, the green line that you see there, is actually, thank you, Catherine, is, is the um, number of videos that have like minute three, minute 13. And so you see that most videos, most videos had at least up to um, all 50 videos that we selected for this project or this uh, particular study had uh, went up to 30 minutes and then it decreased and, um, from there. So uh, what we asked the content leads to do was, was to confirm um, the time segments where the critical incidents or the evidence sort of peaked or, 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 or were most salient um, along the, time, the timeline. And then we, uh, we asked them to group the scales. And so for this particular dimension, um, the communicating with students on the framework for teaching, we put that with a group of skills too. And if you have in front of you the user guide on page 50, let's see, page 52, I believe it is, or 55, you have a description of the group of skills. And so we put this into group of scale two, skills two with establishing a culture for learning and um, in, in managing classroom procedures, and the time frame went from zero to fifteen minutes to thirty to forty to thirty to thirty-five minutes. Okay. All right, you can go to the next slide, Catherine. Thank you. So what we found, um, so we looked at the extent to which we could recover, um, given the given the, the scale groupings, and also given the given the reduced time frames. I should say that we did this for every instrument. Um, given the except for QOT, given the reduced time frame, could we recover the uh, the master score, the master coded score for the particular time segment? And we found that we could, this, this should actually say, um, uh, the findings should actually say score sign based on a segment um, could be recovered using, using shorter target samples of time. So we, in a follow-up study, we actually did look at the part, whole, whole correlations between um, segments, 15-minute segments of a video and the whole lesson and found that we could recover the whole lesson video, which was the average of all the um, master codes, master coded segments. Uh, so we, we could recover that whole lesson score with just um, two of those of those segments pretty reliably. 
Um, and we could also score the instrument reliably when raters only score using a smaller group of skills. In fact, some of the comments that we got back from the individuals who participated in these studies were you know, uh, along the lines of, you know, it was incredibly uh, easy to score or much easier to score with a smaller group of skills and with a larger group of skills. It was easier to attend to just a, a smaller set of traits than having to score the entire instrument. And so we took this information to the APs, and they uh, and they made their final decisions about the time frames. And those time frames, as I said, are located on pages 51 through 57 of your user guide, and you can refer to that um, later on. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So part of the scoring that uh, the scoring design also is um, essentially how, to what degree are we going to control for the quality of scoring once it's underway? And the, uh, the well, the first gateway, if you want to call it that, the first gateway to quality control is the certification test. This is a test designed to measure the scoring accuracy of raters once they have finished training. And how we measure scoring accuracy is to have them score a set of videos and compare their scores to um, a set of master scores, a set of true scores that have been established through the master coding process. And with the, uh, in consultation with the APs, the academic partners, we set initial passing standards and adjusted those standards based on the data that we were getting back um, from, from the, the raters. Um, a lot of that, too, was driven was driven by, a lot of that too was driven by, again, our volume needs. We, we, we needed to get raters through the system, through, through the training process, and into operational scoring. And so um, based on a balance of those needs, based on a balance of controlling quality and also getting uh, the right number of raters through the system, we um, made some critical decisions about the, the passing, passing standards for certification. Um, we gave each rater two attempts to pass certification. Um, and I have to say, you know, the, the passing standards were fairly high once um, we, we made our final adjustments to the passing standard. But there, there, there was a, a, a good percentage of those raters who could not get through certification. Um, and that was OK. Um, so we, we, we got the number that we needed. And, um, in terms of operational scoring, how we were able to organize this large team of raters, we, we opted for a shift-based scheduling model, where, which means that each raider signed up for a shift um, throughout the week. They notified our scoring and logistics office and, and told them basically when they could work. So we made sure that raters worked no longer than four hours in a given day to manage the fatigue effects, possible fatigue effects. There was no overtime in a given week, and that was enforced by the system. And every team was managed by a scoring leader or a team leader. Every day, raters had to calibrate. This was, this was mandatory, and the calibration was consequential, meaning that if they did not pass the calibration test, which was similar in structure to the certification test, but a lot, but a lot shorter, if they did not pass um, after two attempts, then they could not move on to operational scoring. We had a, for uh, phases one and two of the scoring, video scoring, we had a, a small percentage of, of videos that were selected for double scores and a small percentage that were selected for video validity scoring. And validity scoring basically, um, those were the, the videos that were master scored by by our master coding team, and they were seeded. They're seeded into operational scoring, so the raters were unaware that um, of, of which videos were the validity scores and which videos were the operational or the 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 um, the, the videos that were going to be um, used or reported back or used for the um, the research project. And again, the point of uh, the double scoring and the validity scoring was to monitor the, the, uh, the performance of raters. And so what we used those scores for every week was to uh, assess inter-rater agreement, not inter-rater reliability. They're two different, 
two different things. So we, we assess the agreement between the Raider, uh, two Raiders, two, pair, two pairs of two Raiders or pair of Raiders, and between the master code and the validity, the master coder and the um, and the Raider, which is actually scoring accuracy. All right, Catherine, you go to the next. Okay, we're going to take a very brief break here and show you some of the videos. I want to give you a few pointers before we bring them up, and I'm just going to bring them up for a few seconds so you can see what they look like. You can certainly look at them at more of your leisure. As we mentioned before, this was distributed scoring online, so the Raiders were wherever they were. Um, as long as they were in the U.S. and they were someplace we could legally pay them, we did not actually pay a lot of attention to where the Raiders were physically located. The cameras that were used in the MET study were panoramic in that they had a parabolic mirror so we could capture 360 degree video, which was good. Um, we flattened that out for the view of the Raiders in order to standardize the view. We were concerned that a Raider who was watching the panoramic video with the ability to control what they watch might end up with different Raiders essentially watching different videos. If one of them turns the thing 40 degrees to the left and watches the kid in the blue shirt and the other one turns it 30 degrees to the right and watches the teacher, they were effectively watching different classes and we were concerned about that in terms of getting consistent scoring. So we flattened the panoramic videos out and as you'll see, that makes them look a little peculiar you do get used to it fairly quickly, but it does make the room look weird. So when I show you the video, it looks like the walls are warped. They aren't warped. It's just the video being, in fact, circular and then being laid out into a rectangle makes it look strange. There is also a camera that is focused on either the, the whiteboard, the um, screen if they're using a projector, whatever. It's to focus in on where the work is being done if the teacher is doing work on the board, the students are doing work on the board, or they're presenting something in PowerPoint so that you can read and see what they're actually working on because usually the panoramic camera is too far away for that to be legible, so we use the board camera so those could read. That's particularly important for content instruments like MQI and Play-Doh where you want to be able to judge the accuracy of the teacher's work. So. I'll show you what these look like if I can find my way over to the um, system. I'm supposed to be able to. There. Um, so let's look at this one. This is an ELA video. Hey, Catherine. Uh huh. Just a quick question. Are you showing one of the publicly viewable videos here? Do we need to? Yeah, that's why I sent it to you. We can't show this over a webinar. Let me show this one. Okay, that's, I thought we had. Yeah, asked sorry. For that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I don't think I have that one loaded up though. Um, can you see, can you get can you put the link in the um, chat thing so I can just pull it up? Do you have it? Oh, uh, let me see. Anyway. Let me go back to the slides while we pull that up and um, talk a little bit about the distribution rules. The video distribution rules, we, as Jill mentioned earlier, uh, raters can score teachers only if they do not work, have ever worked in that district. So we asked them in the last five years, have you worked in one of these districts? If they said yes, they could still work for the project, but they couldn't score videos from that district. So we just restricted them from every, if you've ever worked in New York City, you couldn't score videos from New York City. Um, and obviously we couldn't have them secondary score a video where they had primary scored it. So they couldn't secondary score themselves. Presumption being that hopefully they would tend to agree with themselves on the first score. Um, we did a special distribution rule which we named for Steve Roudenbush, for those of you who know Steve, he's a great guy and a statistician and psychometrician of some eminence in our field. Um, the intent of this being to reduce some variance associated with Raider biases within a randomization group. So the teachers in a randomization group were set to be scored by the same team of Raiders, if possible, and within time constraints. So once we had assigned a team of Raiders to score the set of videos from the first teacher, the other teacher or teachers in the randomization group, we attempted to assign the same Raiders to score those videos. Within the randomization group, we used a single set of Raiders. Um, this didn't prove to be possible at least part of the time because sometimes the Raiders did not show back up for work, didn't schedule themselves to work within the time constraints we needed to get this done. We did get it done for a fair number of the randomization groups, so we did get to eliminate this particular component of the variance. It turned out to be quite small, but we did actually manage to control it with this queuing, and we built this queuing system into the MET scoring software, which was an interesting statistical challenge to explain to the software designers. And in terms of what the Raiders were asked to do, they were asked to collect evidence as it was relevant to the video, so they had a system space in which they could type in evidence and they could tag it to the video, and it would have an associated timestamp with it. 
and they were able to sort the evidence into categories related to the um, sorry, the rubric components, so they could say that this one is associated with communicating with students and that one is associated with questioning and discussion techniques. So they could sort their evidence and see how things were aligned with what. And then they were required to assign scores to the videos. Um, they were able to eliminate scores from their queue that could defer them if they had specific reasons. It was possible, despite our best efforts, that a rater would be assigned to score a teacher that they knew. Um, if that happened, they were able to defer it and say, I can't score this person because I know them. And they were instructed to do that because this is a very biasing factor. They had the option to defer them if something quite unusual happened in the class and they weren't sure what to do with it. And in that case, those were headed off to our content team for review and decisions. Um, so we did have ways of dealing with unusual cases for the raters. And so set that up in the software in video deferral. So if they deferred an unscorable video, it was looked at by a scoring leader. Because some of them actually had technical difficulties. We occasionally had teachers who set everything up, started the video running, and walked over, and then they shut the um, system down unintentionally. They shut the lid of the laptop thinking the camera would work without it, but that's not true. The camera is, does actually require that the um, software be running and the laptop lid be open. So you would occasionally see a teacher walk over to the camera and whoop, shut it down. That's not a scorable video. And in those cases, those would just be deferred out as unscorable. Um, in most cases, that didn't happen. We'd see it every once in a while. But we would have those things reviewed to make sure that there wasn't a problem. Because sometimes it would be a local problem. If any of you have ever had experiences where your local internet service provider doesn't stream your video quite right on Netflix or on YouTube or somewhere, that happened to the Raiders too. So they would report something as a technical difficulty, and we'd look at it and say, no, it's fine. It was just something local between our server and their computer. So those would be just dropped back into the pool to be scored by someone else. Um, we also had score monitoring. The scoring leader was expected to back score videos. So within their team, they might have five or six raters working under their direction during a shift, and they could blindly go in, pick one that their raters had scored, score it themselves as the team leader, and then compare the team lead scores and the rater scores to see if they were in alignment. If there were any questions or there was something they felt like there was need for a review of the video segment, they uh, could put the segment into what we called joint review. So they could tell the rater, I want to joint review this video with you. And when the rater finished whatever piece they were working on, they would be notified by the system, your scoring leader wants to do joint review with you. And when they clicked through, they got on the phone with their team lead, and they could both watch the video simultaneously and talk about it. We wanted to do that as a process of making sure we could educate the rater so that they understood exactly what they were doing and give them a chance to learn more. So if there was something unusual that happened, the scoring leader had a chance to say to them, this is what you should see here, this is the evidence we hope you're seeing, and this is what we'd like you to do with it. So this gave us a chance to do some sort of continuing education um, and let the raters have a chance to learn as they worked. Let's see if I can get this uh, thing to work again. This is it. That's the board camera. Yeah, the second link is the board camera. The first one that I um, that I sent yep. to you is the. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> Just a second. Aha. Uh -huh. awesome. So this is got it. This is the panoramic video. So as you can see, this looks a little unusual. So I'm going to stop it. This is obviously is a long video, as you can see. This one's only 14 minutes, but that will feel like a lot of time to watch. And as I said, this room is actually, the walls are straight. It doesn't look that way in the video. It's just something you get used to seeing. And if you think of it as you are standing right where that pole is, this room wraps around. So this is the same path of this person. This just happens to have been cut, so this person is split right down the middle. This is the face of this woman in the gray sweater. So if you think of this almost as wrapping around your head and she's standing behind you, this is all 360 degrees of the same class. So this desk is over here close to these kids. It doesn't look that way. It's not intuitive, but that's actually how this room is laid out. Because the panoramic video has been split right here and laid out in a rectangle when actually this is effectively a circular video. This is a 360 degree view of the class. This is the teacher. This person is actually helping set up the video and the students are mostly sitting over here and across here. But these students are actually facing each other. So it's part of the sort of structure of this thing that's not obvious. It makes that wall look bent. 
that wall is straight, and those desks, those sets of desks, face each other directly. So this room looks a little funny. I said, you get used to seeing these when you have done this a lot and your brain processes them fairly easily. But the first time you see one, people tend to react as, what on earth are we looking at? What you're looking at there is an ordinary classroom. It's just the way it would look if somehow your eyes could be sort of split and you could lay this out flat. But that's what the panoramic videos look like. It's just a flattened out view of the camera. Now, there are, if you have panoramic video that can be self-navigable, you can drive them around and you can look at things. But for the Raiders' purposes, we did not want them to do this, so we had them actually stick with this flattened out view, so this was the only thing they could see. Now the board camera, which is this view, actually shows you what the teacher is doing, in this case, on the overhead projector. She's got a warm-up problem here, and she's having them solve these problems. And if you're listening to the um, main video, you see there's the teacher, um, the audio is synced, so you only hear one audio track and you hear her talking and you can see her often in both frames, but it gives you a chance to read what her slides actually say. As you see them in the other view, you can't read this, it's too far away, because if you see it back here, that's the board back there. And it's illegible from the big camera, but it is very legible in the board camera, at least it is when she steps out of the way. Just to give you some sense, you can't actually see a great deal about the content that's being taught, as well as seeing what's happening in the classroom. You can see her walking around, you can see people moving, to get a sense of what this room actually really does look like. And that's what the videos look like. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Jill has mentioned several times, things being master coded. Um, one thing people discover when they develop an instrument is that how, as hard as building an instrument is, and it is actually quite hard, building training it turns out to be even harder because in order to build training, you have to have something to show people. Rubrics, no matter how good they are, can rarely explain everything in text. So you need people to show, show them what it looks like when somebody does questioning discussion techniques at a distinguished level. What does that look like? No matter how good the text description is, until you see it, it's very hard to know it. So you have to find examples. And in order to find examples, you have to find some way of defining these. And the way we do that is this process we call master coding by which we established the closest thing to true scores we're ever going to get in this space. So we had several people involved in this process, our academic partners, our content experts, and our consultants. Um, we did 50 videos for each of the five instruments, so we did master code about 250 videos. We reviewed about three or four times as many in order to pick the 50 that we master coded, so we reviewed a lot of these. We did select them very carefully so they were representative of all the districts, all the grade levels, and all the content, the instruments that are content neutral. It was a very rigorous and very detailed coding process, so we broke the videos into segments, and within those segments, they collected evidence, they time-stamped it very carefully, so you'd see a timestamp that said, you know, from minute three, second three, teacher asked the students, you know, how many giraffes are there in this picture, and the student replies, there are seven, and so there's a whole text piece that describes exactly what happened from minute three, second, minute three, second three, up to minute five, second 47, there's this block of evidence. And that is the data that went into the graph that Jill showed earlier, the frequency distribution of evidence. So we did this in a great deal of detail. It took quite a long time. Um, master coding took between four and six months to do the 50 videos that we had. And they went back and forth many times. There were more than one master coder on every master coded video that we had. And they had to write a rationale. So they not only had to assign a score, but they had to tell us exactly why the thing was at the score level that it was. So they had to provide evidence, had to reference things that happened in the video. They had to tell us why. And that's very important when you're working trying to train people, is not only to tell them this is. So we ended up with a fairly large pool of video segments from which we built the benchmarks, the range finders, the practice, the certification, the calibration, and the validity. So 50 videos is just barely a um, Probably would have been better if we had a few more, but we really didn't have any more time to do this in. So I would recommend more than 50 if you have the option and you're building one of these systems. Um, and the process of master coding always ends up informing the instrument revisions because you discover weaknesses in bang langu vague language and places where it's very difficult to understand exactly what the rubric means. So usually after master coding, you want to go back and make revisions to the instrument, if at all possible. Um, so 
as we've mentioned several times, we recruited a lot of people. We had probably a couple of thousand people apply for this job. Um, so the recruitment strategy was very broad-based. We sort of went everywhere we could, everywhere we could think of to try and find people who could do this. And we took the qualifications that were required from each of the academic partners, asked them who it is they wanted scoring their instrument, and then we went and looked for a lot of them. I think we had about 250 people scoring framework for teaching and about that many on class, and smaller numbers scoring MQI and Play-Doh and QST. Obviously, for the content instruments, we had to have content expertise. Um, most of them were former teachers, though not all. And uh, Jill led a study on the Raider background characteristics to see if any of this made a difference. And it actually turns out that it didn't make a lot of difference. We looked at um, gender, race, ethnicity, highest degree, number of years teaching experience, number of years in teaching. We measured their scoring accuracy based on their certification, their average calibration score, their validity scoring performance. And none of those things were statistically significantly associated with their scoring accuracy. So as those of us who work in scoring have always contended, scoring is in fact a skill set by itself. And somebody who's not a good rater doesn't mean they're not a good teacher or vice versa. Good teachers can be bad raters. Good teachers can be great raters. But scoring is a skill set, and it's distinct from teaching or content knowledge or anything else. You really have to have skills in scoring to be a good rater. Um, this is a moderately complicated diagram of how all the raters got scheduled. So there's a very complex spreadsheet with all the information about them and when they want to work. And our human resources group would create this, recruit them. Our performance area scoring system would invite them to train managing their account. If they certified and there was an application that did this, then they could be scheduled to work. If they were scheduled to work, there was a specific shift schedule, and we had to schedule a team lead to work with those groups, and then there were shift reports of quality of the scoring. So this went on sort of constantly, and there were routinely several shifts a day. So this process really did go on. We get two or three or four shift reports for every single day that happened. So we were watching these things every day. I was running quality control reports every day. We were giving weekly reports back to the Gates Foundations for the months that scoring took. I think we started scoring in April and it finished in November and we did all of this process every single day and reports every week for every period of that time. It was a huge amount of work to manage, but it did guarantee that we got the quality we were really looking for here. So I think we're going to hand this one back over to Jill. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into detail here. You can actually find most of the information that you need for um, the phases of this scoring, this, or the phases of the MET scoring in the user guide, um, the measures of effective teaching um, study user guide. I do want to mention here that, as, and reiterate as before, that there were different processes employed for different phases of scoring, largely because um, of the availability of the scoring software. So for plan B again, we had to employ uh, fairly manual scoring processes. Um, this is a really interesting data set because it does include, um, in addition to the class observation scores, the, it includes the VAM, um, student survey data, supplemental test data, and also um, the student working, con the teacher working condition data. Um, so if you're interested in doing some fairly um, rich research in this space, that would be a really good data set to, to um, grab hold of. And, um, in terms of phase one and phase two scoring, a lot of this, a lot of the changes between phase phase one and phase two uh, had to do with the with how we treated the scales. And so as I mentioned earlier, phase one we had the group of scales and the reduced feeling time, and in phase two, uh, uh, for for certain decision for certain reasons, we implemented the full instrument. Uh, so each rater scored scored a segment or scored multiple segments using the full instrument and all instruments were included in this phase so that included QST as well so all five instruments were included in this phase of um, scoring and then there was a phase three scoring thing that was um, special for Teach for America there were four, about 400 videos that were scored using the class MQI and play instruments okay next slide and uh, Catherine, I don't know if you want to explain this, but <laughs> these are the, essentially this is these are the sample sizes. Um, you you can find more information about this also in your user guide. But this this hideous Venn diagram, um, which Catherine created, um, helped us to plan the the different phases phases of scoring and also how much video, uh, what type of video 
was scored in each phase. And so, um, Catherine, I don't know if you want to say something about this. If not, we can move on. No, I think that covers it. It just it, it, the sample structure was just so complicated that the Venn diagram helped us to understand this. So there's what all's in year one, all is in year two, all that was in the randomization sample, and what belonged in all these little subsets. So the visualization helped me understand which ones were in what sets is all. Okay, great. And uh, so when so when you do log into the video score file, get access to the video score file, what you will see in that file um, are the primary and secondary scores. What you won't see, however, are the quality control, what I call quality control scores that we mentioned, and those are the certification test data, um, calibration scores, the validity scores, and the back scoring. This was a lot of information to pack into an hour, and I'm sure that we didn't give um, many of these topics justice, and so if you have any questions, if you want more information about the behind the scenes um, activities for the MET, uh, the MET video scoring, please feel free to reach out to Catherine or me. Um, you can go also, go, Joanna showed you a link to some of the MET research reports and a lot of this information um, can be found in the MET research reports also. Um, yeah, so again, I just wanted to sort of, you know, put a book into to this webinar and, and, and say again that this was a, a, a really, really good learning experience and how to take you know, large-scale CR scoring processes um, and, tr and translate them to the space and, and, and how to be creative, how to be creative in the, in, in the, in the service of producing high-quality observation data. Okay, that's it. Should we start the Q&A now? If folks do have questions, I encourage you to, to send them in. We can, um, we can spend a few more minutes online if there are specific questions that you have for Catherine or Jill. I don't see anything coming in yet, but it tends to, they tend to come in as soon as I actually start closing down the webinar, so <laughs> I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, well, I don't see any questions coming in. I think that means that you folks answered all of the questions. <laughs> Uh, but you folks, uh, the participants, you have our contact information. There's Catherine's email and Jill's email up on the screen right now. Um, feel free to contact them, contact us. Um, we'd love to hear from you, and thanks for joining us today.